Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and online viewers from around the world, thank you for joining the 2020 Smart City C-Talk Online Innovation Session. C-Talk is a platform for practitioners and city representatives to share their values and visions. This year, our second C-Talk Innovation Session has brought a wide variety of smart city insights from leaders in Germany, Nigeria, Russia, and Ecuador. Delegates from cities worldwide will engage in talks with one another to share and discuss their insights and ideas of the topic response to coronavirus, how coronavirus sparked a wave of innovation in humans' life. Joining the session today, please welcome Commissioner of the Department of Economic Development, Taipei City Government, Mr. Lin Chongjie. Professor Dr. Peter Zack. Founder and CEO of Red Dot Germany. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Dr. Amina Sabumagaji, National Coordinator of Abuja Office for ICT <coughs> Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Nigeria. Hello, everyone. Hello. Mr. Kidio Inyeski. Head of Information and Coordination, Moscow Agency of Innovations, Russia. Mr. Henry Castillo, Revenue Growth Manager of Gamara de Innovación y Tecnología Ecuatoriana, Ecuador. Hello. Mr. Zhou Shuoyan, Director of National Taiwan University of Science and Technology. Hello. Welcome. We will now take a virtual group photo of all the meeting delegates to capture this special moment. Delegates, please look into your camera. We're about to take a screenshot. Ready, set, smile. Next, please put up your right thumb and give us a thumbs up as we take another screenshot. The right thumb, please. Thank you. Ready, set, smile. Thank you for joining the group photo shoot. And now, let us invite the moderator of today's session, Director of National Taiwan University of Science and Technology, Mr. Zhou Shuoyan, to kickstart the session and deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome Mr. Zhou. Again, welcome to the second Smart City City Talk session on innovation organized by Taipei City Government and Taipei Computer Association. I'm Shuoyan Zhou. I'm a professor of industrial management from National Taiwan University of Science and Technology. I'm also uh, running a center on Internet of Things innovation. Uh, the focus of the panel today is on innovation in response to coronavirus. High coronavirus sparked a wave of innovation in human lives. I think all of you have experienced the same thing that we have e experienced in Taiwan. Since the beginning of the year, the entire world has been under the influence of the once in a hundred years pandemic. The spread of the virus has not only deterred the lives of many individuals, but also impact the society as a whole at a much greater scale. Many businesses were facing tremendous challenges simply to survive through the lockdown, yet some instead managed to thrive under difficult situation. With people improvising to overcome the daily hardship, innovative technology will also rapidly de develop and deploy with the hope to contain the damage created by the virus. In Taiwan, we were very lucky, or we have been very lucky, and blessed with minimum interruption and damage. But many innovations were still developed to meet the diverse needs of the society. We saw the ingenuity of the design on masks without string to improve the comfort of prolonged usage of the masks, and also mobile apps helping to manage the equal distribution of masks and to guide people to locations where masks remain available. Globally, we saw people 
though physically apart, finding innovative ways to be connected virtually, and more importantly, emotionally, particularly to support those who were stranded or less, less fortunate. Mobile robots, cobots were quickly put to use much faster than they might have to avoid putting people at risk. While governments are betting on multiple companies or development to ensure sufficient and early access to vaccine, competing pharmaceutical companies, on the other hand, joint hands trying to provide a more equal access to the vaccine. It is a very unusual and difficult time in human history, but it's nonetheless a time where norms can be easily broken and innovation generated at a much faster pace. It is imperative to take this window of opportunity to foster this kind of mentality and abundant fragmented innovation to help heal and move forward our society after the pandemic. Governments will, again, play a pivotal role to lead the recovery and facilitate new development. It should also be noted that the fight against the pandemic will succeed only if people in the entire world work together jointly so that we can walk out of the disaster together. Today in this panel, we have five distinguished panelists from different continents and with different backgrounds and expertise to share with us their ex experiences and insight on how to continue innovation during the and after the pandemic. So again, uh, each of our panelists will have 15 minutes and kindly remind you uh, that um, we are under a, a time constraint. So kindly remind you to complete your presentation within 15 minutes and we will follow uh, with a uh, panel discussion. So let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Lin Chongjie. He is uh, the Commissioner of Department of Economic Development of Taipei City Government. Unfortunately, he has a scheduled conflict and will not be, be with us today. Um, however, he has uh, pre-recorded uh, his presentation. So now we'll listen to his uh, presentation on tape. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As you may know that COVID-19 has utterly impacted on global life, particularly the economy. This presentation shows you the economic impact of pandemic and the policy and action that Taipei have taken to tackle pandemic. WHO declared COVID-19 outbreaks a pandemic on March 11th. Given Taiwan has such experience in 2002, we were allowed in very early stage, which make Taiwan a relatively safe place to live. But the situation is not yet under control. The confirmed case reached 25 million and the death toll has risen more than 900,000 globally. The direct impacts of pandemic on economy are supply disruption, consumption austerity, and the finance volatility. These three crises push production and the consumption to freeze. Among the widely affected fields, these are five industries have lasting damage. Manufacture, physical retail, experience and crop events all require person-to-person -person interaction which become prohibitive or highly regulated. Supplementary services are inevitable affected due to the whole economic group. From the pandemic announcement in March to September, the six months has ensured that the old pattern economy will not come back again. The new normal in the post-pandemic era is essential for economic reform. Globalization with physical travel and overseas supply is in retreat. Localization, on the other hand, taken into account for stable partnership. Restriction on personal contacts for the touch-free economy 
in various ways of drug, nature, and consumption. Government rules travel and the border control. In pandemic, South has a stronger intervention. The new normal business trends have three dimensions. For enterprise, it shifts to autonomous robots for religion production. For in individual, education, job, and healthcare turn to remote mode with ABR support. For consumer, e-commerce and online economy bloom. The technology supporting distance economy mainly are emerging technology, distance platform, and the autonomous engineer. New technology transform business models in wide fields, such as reduced contact service, stay-at-home economy, data security, and life well-being. The pandemic provides pressure for digital transformation of industry, within which business model, management, and the organization are the key people point. As a result, Taipei City government think that we need to work together to build back better. For city government, we need to build digital ecosystem for the future. For the enterprise, we encourage them to invest in technology and talent for innovation. For consumer, retail shift to digital and context-free economy for safe transaction. Three actions are required to forge a digital ecosystem for governments. First, next generation infrastructure. Second, digitalized municipal service. And third, open data. Enterprise innovation initiative include startup support, digital talent cultivation, and to promote innovation pilot. This refers to innovation sites, projects, and application. For consumer, traditional retail shift to smart retail for safe and hygienic environment. E-payment enable accurate and safe transaction. Cross-border e-commerce during pandemic is the only option to expand and enhance within delivery platform. Next session, I will emphasize the new attitudes and actions. Government takes supporting entrepreneurs to sustain and innovate. The government has to redefine its culture as an adapted governance. For municipal level, I think suburbanism is a practical theory to take the flexibility, networking, and devolution into account. We focus on approach where the direct answer. Six approaches are shown above. For example, the vision is co-shaped by citizen society. The deployment of resources is dynamic. Stakeholder works with the synergy platform. Government's role changed to a partner, patron, coordinator, and driver. For entrepreneurs, equally important to government, the support to ent enterprise require an innovative approach and action. I think Enterprise demands three basic needs, menu, networking, and space, which is the phrase three attitudes and three supports, opportunity, collaboration, and platform. Firstly, turn this support into substantial start to subsidies and networking. This virtual start at growth pace shows Taipei government's support innovation in different stage. Secondly, in terms of funding, 1.7 billion of subsidies and 2.1 billion of loan package have approved in the last five years. For incubation, Taipei had five industry quarter with its feature industries. For example, Nangang attracts biocluster and the software park, Neifu, just ICT and media technologies. During the last five years, 23 innovation sites have been planned. 10 of them have been operated. Taipei will have six more data this year. For example, Center for Innovation Taipei in Yuanshan Star Cluster attracts more than 60 startup companies and almost 600 entrepreneurs daily. Another example, 
T. Fishing connects university and the industry with material research, design, and distribution on fashion. We can also witness the archetype assigned as a blockchain incubator from a patent warehouse. Papa Taipei is a restoration from history building and will be the hub for maker and distribution. Within the cluster, Taipei Innovation Habitat is a pilot site for proof of business and a test field of idea for proof of concept. With all star parties, such as founders, investors, technicians, Star Club Taipei is assembled for fight together for world global growth. The global crisis is not over yet. We still work on while, well equipped, and together with innovative entrepreneurs. To the conclusion, I emphasize resilience and adaptation, fair opportunity for all, and the dynamic transformation. And yes, the challenge is ahead. Please join together to roll and sail forward in the storm. Thank you for your listening. Okay, uh, although uh, Mr. Lin cannot be with us today, but I think his presentation does deliver all the key information about the uh, innovation activities in Taipei. Frankly speaking, I live in Taipei my entire life. I, I, I didn't know that there are so many uh, innovative activities we have here in the city. Um, okay, I think uh, let us uh, move on to the next presentation. Um, our next uh, panelist and presenter is uh, Professor Dr. Peter Zack. Uh, Professor, Professor Zack is an international acclaimed design expert and author who became known worldwide, worldwide for initiating and leading the Red Dot Design Award. It's also quite popular in, in Taiwan on this, um, this award. Since 1991, Dr. Zack has been president of the Design Zentrum Nordheim uh, Westfalen in Essen, Germany. He was also the president of both the uh, Federation of German Graphic Designers and uh, the Association of German Industrial Designers. In 1993, he accepted a professorship of business communication at the University of Applied Sciences Berlin, where he lectured for 17 years. Um, an anecdote that I found quite interesting is that until 1991, a logo of the uh, Design Centrum con contained, uh, contained a black dot. Professor Zach believed that the dots should be red to work as a distinction. In gallery, a red dot indicates that a picture is sold and characterized as symbolism that, that is also uh, conductive to a product. Moreover, in year 2000, he renamed the design competition to Red Dot Design Award, and thus created an entire brand, brand world, consisting, among others, uh, a scientific institute, the publisher Red Dot Edition, and several uh, Red Dot online portal. Um, Dr. Zeg is going to share with us uh, a title, um, um, how can cities be redesigned in the combat of the current outbreak and how modern life has to be changed? With great honor, Dr. Zach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, great introduction. Uh, I didn't know how many uh, things I did in, during my life, but uh, uh, thank you for, for reminding me to that. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of your city, Taipei. I travel so many times to Taipei, and I, I like the city very much. And I know how innovative the city is. So that's uh, why I want to share some ideas about the redesigning of the cities. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. You know, design is all about next in new technology developments and the application in our modern life. Design should make our life more convenient, more comfortable, 
and more accessible. And um, the more we live in, in uh, urban situations, the bigger is the challenge to manage the life in this in this uh, big cities. So urbanization is a big mega trend in globalization. Next. Um, we have in 2019, we have already 38 mega cities worldwide with more than 10 million people. This is a big challenge for the whole city management, but it's the big challenge for our daily life as well to manage people, to manage traffic, uh, to manage all the goods uh, and, and the whole system. Uh, next, please. Uh, and 2019, we have 532 cities worldwide with more than 1 million people. This is amazing. Next, please. Uh, we, we have from today, already we live with 56% uh, of the population in the world lives in cities. But the forecast for next uh, forecast for 2050 would be 68 percent. In some areas of the world, in some countries, we have already a, a different situation, a much much worse this, uh, situation. Next, please. Uh, for example, in the United States, already today we have 83rd percent of people living in cities, and the forecast is 89 for 2050. Next, please. Uh, in uh, Brazil, already we have 87% living in cities. Even Brazil is such a big country with so many rural areas. But the forecast for 2050 is 92% of the people will live in uh, cities. Next, please. Uh, I'm coming from Germany, so Germany is a little bit different. We have 77% of people living in cities and the forecast next will be 84%. And finally, have a look to China. Next. In China, we have at the moment 61% uh, of the people living in cities. And next, the poor cast will be 80% for 2050. Next, please. So the question is, will COVID-19 end the trend of urbanization? Will we di think different in the future? Uh, next. Uh, and how difficult the life can be shows us an article in the New York Times uh, where they spoke about the nearly 100,000 dead people uh, because of the COVID-19. And they, they named all the names and they said all these names are part of us. We are part of them. So this is a big, big challenge to deal with this new uh, new. Um, uh, uh, diseases and, and things like this. Next, please. And you see, these pictures remind me to war times. You know, when you see how they bury this, the people in mass graves because they were not able to deal the situation in the United States. This is a, is a shame for our modern society. Uh, next, please. So what we can see, we had have always global diseases and pandemic uh, situations. Uh, one of the worst in, in our life was the Spanish flu in, uh, during at the end of the First World War. Uh, between 25 to 50 million people died during this uh, pandemic. And, um, but the, a, a second one happened with AIDS, we have 27 million to 42 million people already in the last years. So if we compare now COVID-19 to those things, it is relatively uh, low. Uh, the, 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 the risk is relatively low. But the difference is that everybody can be affected very easily. And the risk is very high that we haven't very fast increase of the numbers. So that it makes it so challenging for all of us. And that's why we have to think in, about solutions and about new possibilities of uh, organizing our life in, in an urban situation. But coming back to my question, will this pandem pandemic uh, stop uh, urbanization? Next, please. 
And we can see, we have the numbers on the, on the left side about the pandemic, uh, and uh, we can see that urbanization uh, probably will not be stopped. It will go on because it's a matter of our daily life and it's a matter of industrialization, of our innovative processes. So this will all support the development of uh, uh, new cities and bigger and larger cities. Uh, but I realized, for example, that, um, uh, for example, in America, if uh, you are in a, in a very good situation that you have beside your city uh, loft or your city flat, uh, also a house in the countryside that many people uh, went to on their own on, to a quarantine to stay in, in the countryside to protect themselves. So they disappeared from the cities. Uh, because they wanted to go to the safe area in the countryside. Nevertheless, uh, I, I think and I believe that uh, this uh, growing cities will be also with us in the future. And now we can see that we have in different countries, different cities and different rules and different behaviors. If we now talk about solutions in design, then it is very important that we observe behaviors of human beings because design is based on finding out solutions upon the observation of behaviors. Next, please. So, of course, when this pandemic came over us, uh, the first step was a question of social distancing. So we had uh, many lockdowns in many, many places. But of course, we cannot have a lockdown for the for the for all for all times. Uh, then our daily life will break down, and uh, so this is probably not the right solution. So we have to learn to live with this new challenge, and uh, that brings us to the second step: the smart distancing. Next, please. But how can this work? In in some countries, we have still. The, the question of lockdowns, stay at home, uh, is written on, re, uh, on streets. Next, please. Or we have people who are much better used with situation like this, like in Asia. Uh, you know, to wear a mask is in Europe and even in the United States is, is something that is totally unusual. We never did it before. But in Asia, I know that for Asian people, this is a common thing. So if somebody has a flu for him, it's nothing special to wear a mask to protect himself or to protect others uh, from the virus. Uh, but for, for the Western communities like Europe and, and United States, this is a dramatic change. Next, please. Uh, but nevertheless, also the personal people's behavior is important in situations like this. Uh, if you should wear a mask, but you don't do it, you become a risk for all the other people and for yourself as well. Next, please. And as I mentioned before, in the Western world, people, many, many people uh, feel unfree and unsatisfied uh, and, and, and uncomfortable if they have to wear masks. And that's why they do demonstrations against it. Next, please. So uh, we have different kinds of opportunities to create our new cities. Next, please. Next. And uh, rethinking the city means we have to look for new solutions, but not all the solutions we had in the past are very good ones. Next. Uh, I give you an example for a very bad design solution. This is not an option for the future. Uh, this is just, you know, um, a, a, a solution for the for a very quick moment, but uh, it doesn't look nice and it is uh, not going further. Next, please. Uh, this solution looks much better, but is also not suitable for for our daily life situation. We cannot have this greenhouses uh, for every restaurant. This is. This is very interesting and nice looking at, but it is not a real design good solution for dealing with the virus. Next, please. Uh, and, and this is also a, a, a nice attempt, but it does not solve the problem if we do some, some prints, uh, footprints on the floor in the, in the metro. Now, we need for better and for other solutions. And uh, let's see 
uh, what we can do. Next, please. So uh, we have to, of course, we have to rethink the city by design. Next. And it uh, and there are already some examples. For example, we can uh, sterilize uh, the wagons of the, uh, of the uh, undergrounds or of, of trains uh, with a new method of UV lighting. Next, please. The same method we have in hospitals. We have robots who can uh, sterilize the, the, the rooms in hospitals with the UV light. Next, please. Uh, we can we have air cleaners uh, also for the private use, not just for professional use. For the company Dyson, for example, produces a very nice one. It's a very nicely designed uh, solution for creating clean air and uh, taking out uh, bacteria and viruses out of our daily life. Next, please. And of course, uh, it is very important to have intangible. Uh, items like this uh, self-opening doors in our daily life. This uh, is very important that we don't touch surfaces anymore so much. Next, please. So if we talk about the city, we have to talk about new kind of architecture and uh, new kind of urban planning. Next, please. So the smart city, the city which is uh, a, a kind of a digital city with uh, a lot of uh, information, a lot of digital data, can help us to collect the data and provide information on problematic areas. In this way, hotspots can be identified very quickly. And uh, we can try from the city government to, to make the right decisions uh, and to be very fast and quick with our decisions. Next, please. If it comes to the smart solutions in architecture and urban planning, like uh, the, uh, we think about like intelligent route guidance or avoidance of traffic jams, not just traffic jams with by cars, but traffic jams. No, go back, please. Back. Uh, not traffic jams by, uh, no, back, back not traffic jams with cars, also traffic jams with uh, people, smart design solutions for products and systems, no touch screens, no handles, new, no physical contact, and uh, intelligent waiting systems. So it will change our whole mindset and uh, how our whole understanding of uh, the meaning of a city and the meaning of the life in the daily life in a city. Next, please. And of course, those kind of new products and new situations in the city will infect also our personal behavior. So those cities need smart people and this smart people need to be educated. Uh, this requires a design environment that releases positive moods and energies. And, uh, you know, emotions are crucial. As I mentioned before, some people are not willing and are not used to wear masks so that's why we have to to think about other solutions you know more positive solutions that people really want to take part in saving the situations next please so as a conclusion we can say the smart cities at the beginning from there we go to smart solutions by design in the city we observe behaviors, we observe new technologies, and we try to make applications for our daily life and design. And that brings us, hopefully, to smarter citizens and to a softer and, and much safer situation in our daily life in urban spaces. Thank you very much. Next, be smart and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Zach. I think uh, um, in your talk, you mentioned about the, uh, the trend of, of urbanization. I, I think it's very difficult uh, to avoid, uh, avoid potential problems that happens in the, in the future. Essentially, we'll be living a more dense city, but we need to live more separately or even isolated which is a challenge for all of us. Uh, uh, in fact, I like to go to a coffee shop to sit in the crowd, but be alone. So wearing my, 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 my earphone. 
Unfortunately, we cannot do that. Uh, do the same for for virus. Um, so thank you very much for the enlightening uh, talk. Uh, and you are taking a very different approaches by providing a solution, a smart solution to the the problem of um, pandemic and and the needs of in innovation. Thank you. So. Now let us move to uh, the next uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Amina Sambo Magaji. Uh, Dr. Sambo Magaji is the uh, national coordinator at the Office for ICT Innovation and Entrepreneurship Nigeria. In this role, she's re responsible for coordinating the activities of the technology innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem through driving policy recommendation initiative and program that will create a thriving, a thriving and sustainable ecosystem. Prior to her joining the organization, she started her career as a lecturer and later moved to the Economic and Financial Crime Commission, where she spent over 14 years. Dr. Sambo Magaji is also an advocate for entrepreneurship, female and youth empowerment. She has represented Nigeria in high level meetings in artificial intelligence, excuse me, technology and innovation policy and women empowerment all over the world. She holds a master's with distinction in information engineering with network management from Robert Gordon University Everything Scotland and a PhD from the same university in the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, with great pleasure, let's welcome Dr. Sambo Magaji. Uh, um, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> I'm sorry I have a little cold, but I'll do my best to speak. <clears throat> um, Nigeria was not different during the pandemic. It came in as a shock and everything um, went to a standstill. The government and other key players had to um, innovatively think about the best way to continue um, business and also to continue living in general. All sectors from education, health became um, shut down and we went through a very long long term lockdown um, period technology was not at the forefront of um, the activities within the country but just about three months prior to the pandemic um, the country renamed one of its strategic ministry the federal ministry of communication and uh, um, federal ministry of communication to federal ministry of communication and digital economy and uh, a digital economy policy was drafted, which was also um, approved by the president. And strategies to deploy it um, started to um, this um, was being drafted. So the the approach was quite apt because during the COVID nineteen um, pandemic, a lot of activities um, leveraged on technology. And the need and importance of technology in any in our national economy became very um, important and and clear. So today I would be speaking to you about uh, the office for ICT innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, I would then speak about some of the key things that the country did during the pandemic and what we are still looking at um, after post pandemic. I would also speak a little bit about Nigeria because um, maybe some of us are not really aware of the technological activities that um, that are within Nigeria, just to give you an insight of the technology and innovation, innovation ecosystem and to invite you to uh, join us in partnering and um, fostering the growth of the very large market within the country. So um, thank you for the introduction, Igor Moderator. OIIE is a subsidiary of NITDA. While NITDA is the National Information Technology Development Agency, um, it's, uh, it's in charge of developing and regulating 
IT in Nigeria. So due to the importance and uh, relevance of um, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, the OIIE was set up um, to foster the growth of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and also um, ensure that um, we, we achieve the following objectives. We ensure patronage of our local content development and promotion in ICT, um, to result in job creation for the teaming Nigerian youth. We have a very large population of over 200 million, uh, and over 50% of that population is the youth. And also to contribute to the GDP of Nigeria, ICT has been contributing um, incre increasingly um, for the past five years into the GDP of Nigeria. Um, OIIE also drives this vision through initiatives, partnerships, and programs, as well as um, as well as other activities to um, foster to ignite the regional ecosystems. So the office is positioned to drive the digital entrepreneurship agenda of the national um, digital economy. So the digital entrepreneurship is one key pillar. As you can see here in the picture, it's the president, our minister, and some entrepreneurs um, that got some international award. They were being recognized within the country. So we have a number of programs. Um, those that are within um, the, the state that we're in, the federal capital in Abuja, where we try to, so these are the various programs, where we try to bring innovation to the face of um, the different sectors in government. So we challenge the youth um, in partnership with academias. We run, uh, for example, I'll just speak on future hacking. So we run a program where we um, throw a challenge on a particular sector. So, for example, um, we've done education, health. This is post uh, pre pandemic. So, um, education, um, health, um, security. So, the, the team in youth would come up with a number of um, 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 ideas and solutions or projects they are working with within the university. And we targeted university because that is where a lot of research is being done. And we feel. Um, the collaboration is very apt for the country. So solutions and ideas that are um, identified from this program are now incubated through our um, accelerators and um, incubators. And um, we follow through for, um, to see that they are being implemented. And um, another one is, another key one is this um, Summer Kids Codes Camp. This is a program where during the summer we work with uh, the different regions in Nigeria, the different regions um, the schools, just to um, have some uh, interactive and um, and uh, and hands-on, yeah, hands-on um, classes for the youth between uh, primary school to secondary school for them to start uh, picking up interest in STEM and also technology as a whole. Um, teaching them um, important skills such as um, creative thinking and all that. We can go to the next slide, please. So the activities of the office as indeed, we can go to the next slide, please, as indeed um, created a lot of international recognition. Um, we've had our startups do things on artificial intelligence, um, health, uh, we have Max.ng, which is a startup that is similar to Uber, but for motorbikes. Uh, we have a lot of motorbikes um, in the country, and due to the economic, um, due, due to the landscape of the country, they are easier to move around than um, the normal cars. So this Max.ng, please go back a little, one more. So the Max.ng is an application, is a is a startup that um, that is a transportation and logistics startups that uh, is created indigenously and is making a, a difference here. And then we have Aaron, which is a, a drone service for medical supplies. So it caters for the rural area to ensure that um, while the roads are not good, we can leverage on things like um, drones to supply the innovation. Um, so we've engaged with a lot of um, partners. We can move to the next slide, please. 
both um, national and multinational. So um, internationally, we've had a lot of um, players um, reach out to the office to partner in either policy, program implementation, or inter-country um, exchanges. And most of the um, top-level um, IT companies, the tech giants, they have opened up offices in Nigeria due to the um, very active um, ecosystem that Nigeria has, especially in Lagos. We have an innovation portal, and it's still growing. And the innovation portal is we have startups, hubs, investors, and partners, and the activities and um, uh, capacity buildings that happen is all featured there. It's still growing. So coming to the um, COVID-19 outbreak, yeah, the COVID-19 outbreak, of course, presents an alarming, we can move to the next slide, please, an alarming health crisis that the world is battling with. It's not just Nigeria. It's not just the emerging countries or the developing countries. It's everyone across the world. The pandemic has indeed affected every sector of the Nigerian economy, including the telecoms, technology, education, health, trade, and especially the SMEs. Um, IT services across the world have been a uh, significant uh, increase in demand since the advent of the COVID-19. It's the same with Nigeria. In as little as um, the country has been leveraging on um, technology to host meetings and other things, which was not the case uh, prior to COVID-19. It was always, it always had to be things um, done physically and things like that. Um, expectedly, the rise in demand for data and voice, so the, inf the technology, tech telecommunications infrastructure also spiked, uh, and also consumers have had to depend on these services to work from home. A lot of activities have happened in terms of working from home. It was not something that you were used to. So the culture of technology is really building momentum within the public service and the country at large. So maintaining social ties and um, access to other entertainment and training became a challenge. Um, so here I'll just speak about what the government did. So there are no, a number of initiatives that happen and continue to happen uh, while we're still battling with this um, pandemic. So NITDA, that's my parent agency, um, within the first week uh, called, uh, reached out to um, top players in the sector and created a 10-man advisory committee. Um, the government private sector has never been a very key, um, they've never been key in coming together. I know this is something, this is a challenge across the world, but specifically in Nigeria, um, the private sector and the government um, find it very difficult to work together and everyone works in silos and things like that. But during the pandemic, there was an interesting um, concurrence. Everybody just came together and we worked together to come up um, with um, key policy recommendations, key initiatives that would uh, support um, business continuity within the country, that would um, support sustaining the economy through technology, that would support um, SMEs and um, other IDEs, innovation-driven enterprises, to make sure that they are not um, hardly hit by the pandemic. And um, with the recommendations, we are now currently, we've, we've worked on the recommendations are not just for COVID-19, but even post-COVID-19. So the ones for COVID-19 have been achieved. We have um, worked together collaboratively to make a lot of um, impact. We're still sustaining that momentum in continuing to implement um, other policies and um, initiatives to ensure that uh, the pandemic uh, the the uh, we build we are building a stronger and more collaborative ecosystem. So the Central Bank of Nigeria and other financial institutions also came up with uh, grants and facilities, um, loan facilities that had um, not very stringent conditions, and they were accessible to um, SMEs. There was a lot of um, those um, funding all over, and a lot of competitions also happened across um, the countries in identifying innovative solution. So um, I think I've already spoken about that. I'll just mention that um, a number of the government agencies during the pandemic 
um, had an, a, a lot of not only not only federal government but state government had a lot of programs um, uh, planned, and um, they were encouraged. I think over seventy percent of these programs across Nigeria, um, the thirty six states, you know, were encouraged and guided to to uh, make it online. So a lot of the programs were made online, and we had the first. Um, uh, Federal Executive Council, which is a weekly meeting chaired by the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It also held remotely um, within the first two weeks of the pandemic, and it continued until the lockdown eased. So for us, it was a, a, a very huge um, leap from where we were to where we have become, and um, in terms of the adoption of um, technology. So like I mentioned earlier, we also did... Uh, number of um, innovation challenges. So both government, federal government, state government, and private sector were all um, encouraged to, to do um, facil to, to facilitate innovation challenges where we're coming up with ideas and ways to um, cushion the impact of the pandemic and also to continue living in general. So the one, the main one was the Nigerian COVID-19 Innovation Challenge. And in that particular challenge, we um, opened a call for application. We had um, support from uh, MIT. We had support from, because we're engaging with MIT on a program called Regional Entrepreneurship Acceleration Program. So they have frameworks that would support you building the building blocks of uh, innovation entrepreneurship regional ecosystem. So through part of that, um, this strategy was in partnership with um, MIT, and we opened a call um, for Nigerians that are in Nigeria and in diaspora to apply. We got a number of um, applications from local ventilators to testing booths, decontamination centers, and other tech-enabled solutions that are prototyped and developed by our um, startups. Um, some hospitals also adopted technology such as telemedicine and the likes for diagnosis. So we had applications that were even helping you to test um, COVID-19. I know this might sound um, um, like business as usual for a lot of uh, maybe countries that are speaking on this panel or listening. But for Nigeria, it was it was a major it was a major um, breakthrough, and uh, in terms of technology and uh, the culture change was really, really um, encouraging for us. So for the Nigerian COVID-19 Innovation Challenge, the top three um, solutions were an, um, a ventilator. Uh, a number of our youth came up with local ventilators that were cheaper um, than the ordinary ventilators, and that made, this made it more available uh, uh, across the different um, states. We also had uh, contamination cham um, chambers, and these contamination chambers were installed in all those places that were con that were um, called essential. That were um, having essential services, and people needed to go. So your hospitals, your other um, essential services. So uh, we promoted the use of these chambers in um, the in decontaminating um, individuals as they continue to move around. And we have had a number of health um, applications too, where uh, because at that time, of course, people were staying away from going to the hospitals. So you could have access to your facilities, doctors, and um, diagnosis um, via your phone. Um, another challenge was the, another key challenge was the Ventures Platform COVID challenge. And five of them, please let's move to the next slide. And five key solutions were um, identified. So, um the the well this was also a health um a health solution it was it, it was um its main yeah. um, minimum value proposition was in identifying risk assessment for accessing your risk of exposure to covid-19 and we had um other solutions that were focused on contact tracing um we had a lot of uh, solutions um, that we're working on um, infodemics. So at that point in time, information and data was also another challenge that we had within the um, country, but around information dissemination. But, our, but during the pandemic, um, info, uh, we had an application called infodemics, which is 
web based and it had the potential it had the ability of harnessing um and disseminating real time information so they worked with our ncdc um that's the nigerian center for disease control to um curate um data and make it into useful information and disseminate it um, through the different channels from TV, radio, newspapers, so that people would know the numbers, would know what's happening, uh, and, and things like that. And also, um, and also we had we had uh, we had uh, online platforms where uh, and communities where there were there were access to a lot of um, resources. People could just go online and had resources for learning, learning new skills. NIDA also opened a NIDA Academy, which during which was launched during the um, pandemic. And between now and the pandemic, we've we've we have over a million youth joined and completing a number of digital courses. So this has really really enhanced um, digital skills within Nigeria. So some quick facts about Nigeria. Nigeria has over two hundred million uh, people, with approximately seventy percent um, young people. Um, Nigeria remains the most, the world most mobilized country. So both re um, rural and urban, almost everybody has a phone and has access to the internet. And that's what's creating a lot of um, visibility to the ecosystem. And the Nigerian continent has also witnessed a lot of foreign direct investment. The amount of investment that comes to the um, um, tech ecosystem in Nigeria is even more than the one that we invest um, ourselves. So from two, um, from quarter one of 2018, we've had um, nine over nine million, and we are speaking about hundreds of millions. Um, I think about 500 million as at quarter two of um, this year. So we have a very thriving ecosystem that emerged from a bottom up approach. Um, three companies that we have that sold over. 100 million um, dollars, uh, Adela, um, Conga, and Jumia. Jumia, in specific, is actually the only African unicorn. And Nigeria is also thriving in the fintech sector with um, applications such as uh, Flutterwave and Paystack. So Nigeria is, uh, is, is really emerging in terms of um, the innovation and entrepreneurship in Nigeria. So I, here I'm just sharing my contact details with you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on this panel. Thank you very much for your sharing. Um, I think uh, your sharing on the government activities on pa pa pandemic uh, mitigation is very thorough. And it's also encouraging to, to hear you, uh, your description of cultural change uh, in terms of technology adoption and government industry partnership. Uh, since you have been champion on education, uh, for your information, uh, we do have quite a few uh, Nigerian PhD students studying in Taiwan on science and technology <laughs> issues. So uh, hopefully you can also encourage more students uh, or faculty members exchanging with us in Taiwan. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much. We can take that up after this. Okay. Hello? Yes, yes, yeah. I've heard that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. Okay, so um, now we, let's move to the, uh, the next presentation by uh, Dr. Kirill Ionitsky. Uh, Dr. Ionitsky is Head of Information and Coordination and International Affairs at, uh, at Moscow Agency of Innovation. Uh, he was a strategic advisor and manager in urban innovation, arts and culture, and education. He was also a consultant of European and Russian companies, cities and associations, co-authors of development programs for cultural, educational, and, and technological centers. Uh, Dr. Yonitsky, uh, based on your information, you seem to have two PhD. Uh, one in anthropology from Germany and the other in aesthetics from Italy, a true Renaissance man. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Yonitsky uh, for, for his sharing. Uh, okay, dear friends, I would like to 
greet you all from Moscow, which is a sunny place today. Uh, hello to, to Ecuador, Germany, uh, China, ta Taiwan, and uh, Nigeria. We have all over the world, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. I will talk about a tool that you might find interesting, and uh, I think the whole world pretty much found it um, uh, relevant and helpful. So please have the first slide. So the Moscow Agency of Innovations, together with Health Innovation Exchange, by UNAIDS is an agency of the United Nations, and the International Research Agency Startup Link launched a special coronavirus innovation map at the beginning of the pandemic in March. We decided to do some uh, important tool for the countries of the world and innovative companies to, to share they are best solutions that would uh, help to fight the pandemic. Uh, we, my department was responsible and me personally for finding new solutions for Moscow. So we saw that there is a lack of the, of the tool that might help us to find new things. But we decided to do something that would, might be useful, not just for us, but the, for the whole world. So we shared and helped and contributed to this map. So they all, um, countries and cities of the world and ministries of healthcare will be able to to find and, and the best solutions and contact their developers. So the opportunities of the coronavirus um, innovation map, which you can find on the coronavirus startup link dot com, are there and, and to help uh, teams of innovators to cooperate and build solutions faster. So if there are solutions which are similar. Uh, the map encouraged some of them to join forces and create a common solution and move much faster than they would do by themselves. Another is that the map, it would map the innovations related to tackling coronavirus in various um, fields, such as diagnosis, uh, treatment, lifestyle changes, etc., and on geographical scale. And uh, thirdly, it would help the uh, public and private sector identify innovative projects relevant to them by location. So I just mentioned the, 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 uh, the partners. One is the Special Health Innovation Exchange, which the United Nations created in order to share uh, various technologies and uh, approaches uh, to healthcare. Second is the famous startup Blink uh, company that uh, actually maps, uh, their specialization is to map the startups and us who join all these forces um, and put them together and uh, and launch this this um, I think quite reliable and high quality and useful map. Next sli slide, please. So we have some, of course, um, top solutions from Moscow. For example, Entech Lab um, would provide a special analysis of video surveillance that would uh, be able to identify people who would break epidemiological laws. Um, even if they are wearing the mask, which is uh, which is um, quite a unique opportunity, quite a unique uh, company. Botkin AI, special AI platform that helped um, that helps to uh, to diagnose um, coronavirus and other illnesses through the AI and images. Mm -hmm. Neurobotics and the famous digital pass system introduced in Moscow, highly efficient system of, of uh, control during the pandemic and lockdown which we, we also encourage the Yandex um, self-isolation index, uh, which uh, ha helped to see which cities and the regions would be um, less active and more uh, abiding the lockdown, uh, because the lockdown wasn't uh, like 100% total. It wasn't a totalitarian or authoritarian anti-democratic thing. So it was all based on discipline, on um, past systems, but also on people's uh, awareness what they are doing. And the Yandex Self-Isolation Index is one of the important tools that help people to understand and realize in certain cities that they were quite disobedient to the, um, to the policies that were needed. And the Holo Group, uh, the special uh, electronics to provide companies a platform to be able to push through the uh, with virtual exhibits. This is uh, one of the solutions that would be useful for the post coronavirus map that will be um, a development of the coronavirus map. How to build a world which is resilient to to the this kind of pandemics. How to put a lot of activities uh, online, but in an efficient way. 
So Hull Group and its solution is also an opportunity to to made a platform that enables to make the exhibitions, to show the products, etc., in a very realistic way, but online. Please, the next slide. So if we see the real users, that map, map will help and already helped cities and countries to find the best solutions to combat COVID-19. To corporations and investors to search for promising solutions in the integrate into complex products. Please look, uh, look up. I think, uh, well, of course, we encourage you to look uh, at the at Moscow solutions, but we mapped all solutions uh, from all over the world. So we are very interested in in investors and partnerships. We 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 are happy when our map helps uh, corporations and startups find each other and develop something really really useful for the world, and for startups to get partners to integrate and accelerate results. We've seen many many examples. Um, where startups found their investors and partner corporations and cities through the through the map. So mapping proved to be a really efficient tool to pair and to join forces to fight uh, the common threat. And for journalists and experts to receive the updates on best practices and their effectiveness, uh, we have seen a lot of interest uh, for the map in the global media. Please, the next uh, slide. Um, so, but first, how to submit your solution. So we encourage people and companies and the city administrations to submit uh, technical solutions, but also organizational practices to combat COVID or to adapt the world to the post-COVID world to submit their solutions to the map. So there is a um, quite clear procedure, which you see on this, web, on, on this, um, on this um, slide. I think the slides would be uh, um, shared by the organizer so you can see and follow the procedure so you just need to register add your solutions and, um, then uh, make a special description and then it will be uh, analyzed by the moderators experts of the united nations uh, to, to check if the, the the solution is suitable for for this map and the quality is quite enough quite quite high because the map actually is not just a collection of solutions, but it's a collection of uh, selected solutions based on certain criteria, which are also named on this slide. So if you control the map, if you check up the map, you may be sure that it has only good solutions, only viable and high quality ones checked by the United Nations experts. Next slide, please. So if we are talking about the effect and about the attention, so we had half a million visits from 130 countries. Uh, based on domains, we see that more than 70, 70 ministries of the healthcare of the countries of the world actually used the map. They visited and saw. I know that uh, Moscow used more than 20 solutions from the map. Uh, I mean the solutions from outside of Moscow, so it was useful also for us. But we saw that 70 countries also benefited uh, from, to a certain extent, someone bought solutions, others invested, others used the information in order to to, uh, to develop their own solutions. But we think that we that this small project, a small in um, from the management point of view, uh, was really efficient uh, um, um, uh, on the global scale. And we think that the world, like the pandemic, showed us that we live on the in the same planet, on the same planet, that we are a part of the global world. And if there is a problem, then this problem become, becomes global very fast. So the global problem needs also the global solutions, solutions that don't need to be, you know, to be done in a certain closed way from everyone. Uh, so this map is um, is a demonstration of our willingness. To, to share the expertise and knowledge and to help and uh, uh, facilitate the dialogue between the countries of the world in tackling uh, complex problems. So we opened up all results, we made it uh, public available, we made it in English, we made it with international partners because we think that uh, you cannot uh, tackle the global problem locally. Okay, so for now we have more than a thousand solutions uh, checked and uh, uploaded on the map. And we have a, a quite an impressive media coverage with total audience with more uh, one uh, and a half billion uh, people. Um, the map was mentioned by the Times, by Forbes, by El Pais, 
uh, by MSN, Chrome, Yahoo. So by, by the best uh, websites, it showed that actually the um, the global um, the global public is very ready for the things that are readily available for all countries. We don't need to, to make uh, appropriate solutions. We need to make them available for everyone, and, and especially uh, for the developing countries that need to be helped in the expertise and in the things that will might help them to, to you know to tackle the problem that they didn't create. Okay, so please um, check out the map. Please uh, use it. Please think about the developments in the po in the post coronavirus world, and also add me on LinkedIn um, if you have any ideas uh, of collaboration with Moscow on COVID or on any other international theme and uh, high tech and innovation. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and I greet you all, my dear friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your information. I have already checked your LinkedIn before the, the session. I'll, I'll add you to my LinkedIn uh, friends. Great, uh, great. <laughs> and, and thank you for, for sharing a lot of innovation, uh, the system that you have in, in Moscow and uh, your willingness to share this information uh, with the rest of the world. I think it is uh, uh, really important uh, to acknowledge that uh, this is a global problem. We have to solve the problem together rather than uh, solve it, as you said, as you put it, uh, as a local problem. So thank you. Thank you. So let's move to the, uh, the final presentation of this session. Uh, we have Mr. Enrique Castillo, um, who is a young and energetic entrepreneur, as you, you can see. Uh, Mr. Castillo is a PKI expert from Barcelona, Spain, currently based between Quito, Ecuador, and Barcelona. He's passionate in everything related to innovation of business procedures and using new technology to improve people's lives. His career has been focusing on business development and product improvement. I have eight years of experience working in certification world at different positions, starting as a developer and now as a CEO. Uh, let's welcome uh, Mr. Castillo. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, I'm Enrique Castillo uh, from Ecuador. Mm -hmm. It's a little late here, or maybe uh, too early. It's, it's 3 a.m., but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to begin this presentation uh, telling you an experience that I have lived uh, the first days of the quarantine. Uh, next slide, please. Day 35th, we are getting used to the home office, the home school. We are doing grocery from home. We have not gone out to dinner, and we are friends of the Uber Eats rider. But something important came to me. We used to go to pediatrician, but now? When was our last visit to the doctor? Okay, keep calm, I say to myself. Tell him his assistant always reminds us when we have the next appointment. Probably she forgot to call us in the middle of this emergency. Next, please. No one answers the phone. Okay. Let's try with the doctor's personal phone. Hi, I was calling your office, but nobody answered. The long boss told me that something was wrong. He was not working because of the pandemic. Okay, Enrique, ask your friends for their trusted pediatricians in the city. After a few calls, I found one who was attending via telemedicine and scheduled an appointment for the next day. Easy, or at least until this moment. The worst was yet to come. Next, please. Uh, next, next, next. Uh, okay, the, the new pediatrician started with a lot of questions. When was your last visit to the pediatrician? Uh, how much does your baby weigh? How tall is the baby? Uh, maybe vaccines pending? And my wife also turns her head, waiting for me to answer. I was supposed to know all that, but 
Let's put But I don't know. That terrible experience ended with a rescheduling until I get all that information that a physician needs. Why I'm unaware of all this information about my child? Since when I am dependent on my doctor? Since when did I lose control? What happens if the doctor moves to another city? Or if I move to another city? Uh, I did that six times before my child was born. Or maybe if the doctor retires. Or in the worst case, what happens if the doctor passes away? I had never been aware of how important it was to have medical information at hand. Next, please. The health industry is very traditional and has never had the patient at the center of the operation. So we, the patients, have to demand that now we are the most important element because we suffer, we get sick, and we pay. As the people become more concerned about access to care, it will become crucial for health organizations to find new ways to work with patients and offer more value to our lives. Uh, next, please. And what about governments? We as startups are always fighting against the status quo and design against an industry as large and powerful as health. We need to move awareness within government so that public policies are directed towards the creation of networks where we all use the same standard of medical record, where public and private hospitals share information, and where it does not matter where I get sick, doctors can access to all my medical information. But the governments are also interested in predictive analytics because with early intervention, many diseases can be prevented or ameliorated, and this will allow primary care physicians to identify, address patients within their practice, and with that knowledge, patients can make lifestyle changes to avoid risks, and the public spending in healthcare will decrease. Next, please. Okay, let's assume that this first dream is achieved. And what is next? This patient-generated information when combined with historical clinical data, can help providers derive <clears throat> with insights that drive lower costs and improve outcomes in care. With conversations about customer data ownership becoming more mainstream, patients may increasingly turn to healthcare organizations that have earned their trust and that may offer incentives for patients to share their information with providers. Now we talk about preventive medicine, but with all this medical data, we can offer new services to the patient and talk about a real predictive medicine. We are facing the creation of a new medical speciality. Currently, there are pediatricians, gynecologists, cardiologists, but what about a doctor who analyzes all the various possibilities of predictive analytics in healthcare? It is first important to analyze the different ways through which healthcare can benefit from this display. This includes operational management, such as the overall improvement of business operations, personal medicine to assist and enhance accuracy of diagnosis and treatment, and cohort treatment and epidemiology to assess potential risk factors for public health. The statistical methods are called learning models because they can grow in precision with additional cases. There are two major ways in which predictive analytics differs from traditional statistics. First, predict <clears throat> First predictions are made for individuals and not for groups. And second, predictive analytics does not rely upon a normal curve. Prediction modeling uses techniques such as artificial intelligence to create a prediction profile, or also known as algorithm, from individuals. The model is then deployed 
so that a new individual can get a prediction instantly for whatever the need is, whether a bank loan or, in this case, an accurate diagnosis. Creating risk scores based <coughs> creating risk scores based on lab testing, biometric data, claim data, patient generated health data, and the social determinants of health can give healthcare providers insight into which individuals might benefit from enhanced services or wellness activities. What would you think if someone advises you to change your way of life to prevent diabetes? a cardiovascular accident, or to live longer. All this is possible with the use of centralized information repositories and the proper analysis. In conclusion, patients will have to become better informed and will have to assume more responsibility for their own care if they are to make use of the information they write. And physician roles will likely change to a more of a consultant than decision maker, who will advise, work, and help individual patients. Changes are coming. The smart industries will anticipate and prepare. These changes will revolutionize the way medicine is practiced for better health and disease reduction. Thanks for your attention. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, Mr. Castillo's uh, sharing. I think um, this is a, uh, really a very uh, important um, talk. As uh, in the talk, uh, Mr. Castillo touched upon the uh, issue on the data. I think this is the biggest uh, issue that we have or we are facing in the world nowadays. Uh, you talk about privacy of the data availability of data, but in fact we are also concerned with the ownership of data and the integrity of the data. Uh, without the integrity of data, uh, the prediction that we, we make may be uh, uh, distorted. Um, your suggestion of a central, centralized repository or archive is also, I think, globally people are trying to do that, but there are also a lot of issues that we need to address. That is uh, to have balance between technology, right? technology or solution and the privacy and safety of, of, of human. So it, it ties very well uh, to our discussion. So thank you. Thank you again. So, so now we conclude our uh, all five presentations. I think I would like to thank all the uh, presenters, particularly uh, to Mr. Castillo, because it's 3 o'clock in the morning in Ecuador. Thank you for staying up with us. Thanks to all the delegates for their insightful presentations. We will now begin the round of panel discussion. Once again, let us invite today's moderator, Mr. Joe, to host the discussion. Mr. Joe, the floor is all yours. OK. So uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Lin will not join us. Uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sambo Magachi has left uh, for another meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I, I guess uh, uh, we'll have uh, the uh, still we still have three uh, panelists to to have short discussion on on issues that uh, provided by the organizing uh, committee. So maybe let me repeat the uh, the question, and uh, you don't have to respond to the question specifically, because I, I feel that in your presentation, there are more specific issues relevant to the question that you should be able to address much better. Uh, so the question, the first question is COVID-19 has changed people's life, work, social life, and entertainment. When it comes to the low contact or contact freak technology, digital economy, or virtual economy, what kind of roles do you think they will play in the future of society? Uh, maybe we'll start, start uh, with uh, Dr. Zach, if you are yes. willing to share. Yes, uh, as I tried to mention in my presentation already, that uh, if, we, if we are searching for a new 
solutions in design, we have to observe the behaviors of people. And for sure, the COVID-19 situation has changed our behaviors. Mm -hmm. You know, we had this kind of lockdowns. Now we do this kind of video conferencing. This is all new. And uh, so the solution will be that we will have to develop much better technologies and much better designs for uh, skills like this, for example. Making a video conference uh, uh, even more exciting uh, from the uh, interference. Uh, if I watch me now, uh, there is a time time gap between my movement and yours. So there is a there we can do a lot of things to make this more natural, and uh, we have things like this in every uh, area of our daily life. Uh, so we could take the COVID nineteen thing as not just as a challenge but also as a change and as a chance for developing a new kind of life in, in our urban environment. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ionitsky? Dr. Ionitsky, can you well, share with us your opinion? Think, yeah. we, we think that, um, uh, that it, it has been a great opportunity uh, for us to check the services we you know probably that in 2018 mm -hmm. uh, moscow has become the first um, city in the world in the global e-government ranking by the united nations and we are we are so proud and happy about our achievements mm -hmm. but when the covid 19 uh, came we saw some shortcomings especially in right. the schooling in moscow electronic school mm -hmm. and we saw that it needs development that it needs uh, more content and the private companies were very successful in um, in uh, adding some important points into our city's uh, education city's online system. Mm. So we see so the shortcomings, we saw that we all always planned the online thing as some, something auxiliary, something additional to the real education offline. Mm. But when we, we, we faced the world where we needed to do it all online, we saw that it's not sufficient, that we need to make more developments to make it more entertaining, more useful, more technologically uh, sound and more, let's say, uh, finished as a complex of online. Yeah, mm -hmm. something that uh, that precludes the existence of online. I should say, from my private experience, in Russia there are two banking um, online banking giants. One mm -hmm. is Sberbank, which is also a, an offline bank, the mm -hmm. biggest in Russia, mm -hmm. and another was a small startup, Tinkoff Bank, but mm -hmm. it didn't have any offline presence. So that Tinkoff that didn't have even 1% of resource that Sberbank had, has beaten or almost beaten um, the Sberbank in terms of uh, credit cards and accounts and online banking. It's the largest online banking in the world currently. Mm. Just because it didn't have anything offline, mm. it managed and learned to solve all, prob all problems mm. online. Mm. So the COVID-19 is just this simulation to show, like, you cannot say that you need to go to an office. You cannot say that you need to, you know, to do some uh, procedure or some part of program offline. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then you start to realize how complex and how how working, how efficient is your real program. So we think, I think that um, it has been a large opportunity for the development mm -hmm. of the online formats of any kind. Mm -hmm. But also we started to, um, you know, I think the offline now has a very high price. Uh, we, we appreciate it more. We appreciate the time every single minute, and we use it more efficiently. Like all offline um, uh, talks, all offline lectures, all offline uh, collaborations become more efficient now because it's uh, it's like with cinema and theater. Right. When uh, the cinema arrived, it was just an imitation of theater filmed. But when it developed, the theater has changed a lot as well. Yeah. The theater has become more theatrical, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you know what right. I mean. So offline is more right. offline-ish now, okay. which we appreciate a lot. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, ju ju just out, out of curiosity, are you aware of any of out of your 1,000 innovation that uh, if, whether or not there's a solution to avoid wearing masks? Uh, avoid wearing masks. Yeah, wearing well, masks. Well, there is a complex mask, like a, a round thing. <laughs> <laughs> then other, the vaccine. 
the Russian vaccine again, Sputnik W, a Sputnik V, which is actually precluding you from wearing masks because you have immunity, oh. we suppose. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. How about Mr. Thank Castillo? You. Uh, any anything that you want to share with us on this issue? Yeah, I believe that the way that people interact on our lifestyle has definitely changed. Uh, mm. Until now, we were not aware of the need of uh, technology. Uh, telemedicine uh, was here uh, for a couple of years, but we were not really using it. Uh, but now, uh, at this moment of emergency, where we we need to reduce travel and risk. Uh, we appreciate uh, the technology to, for example, telemedicine, electronic prescription, or laboratory exams uh, at home. Uh, and this change uh, shows us a different way to interact with physicians or with healthcare uh, organizations. Uh, for example, uh, for a simple question, uh, we don't need to go to the hospital uh, and we can do a better use of these uh, health resources or the healthcare system. Uh, we can do a better use, uh, maybe doing uh, uh, interaction uh, via telemedicine or for example with, uh, with chat or a, a, a different way to interact with our physician and we can improve and this emergency uh, show, uh, shown us uh, how a different way to interact with the healthcare industry. And I think that, that uh, it's good. Uh, it, it was a, a hard hit for, for the people to change their, their lifestyle, but uh, I think that definitely change and, and telemedicine and technology uh, in the healthcare uh, uh, has come to, to stay here. Mm, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. I, I think I, I, I do agree with our, our panelists that the, um, in, the, in the future, this uh, technology will, will, will uh, affect our lives uh, in many aspects. I think all these digital technologies, particularly when we are se uh, separated physically, but can be connected more smoothly. Uh, that's something which is very, also very important. And um, something we took it for granted, um, but now we, we need to deal with. Uh, for example, I think mass is a big issue all over the world. Um, and, and I think there should be more technologies that, that can be applied to, to, uh, to, to change the situation. Um, and, and I think uh, the most important part is the pandemic changed the culture, as all of you uh, said uh, some, somewhere in, in your presentation. It changed the culture. Changed the culture in the sense that the technology adoption could be faster and people are more willing to venture on different new technology rather than uh, waiting for the te technology to cross the chasm as we usually talk about technology uh, life cycle. Uh, so it is also a good opportunity for, for us to move forward a lot of new innovation after the, the pandemic. Um, which leads uh, us to the, the next and the last question that we, we would like to address. How can we connect the star community in government's pandemic control work? Can we also start from uh, Dr. Zach? Yes, uh, I, I, I like what our friend from uh, Russia said. He mm. said uh, sure. the pandemic is, is, a, is a global issue and uh, we cannot solve it uh, on a local uh, base. We have to solve it in a, local, in a global uh, context. And uh, so that helps a lot that uh, governments mm. uh, to talk to each other, have to share experiences and have to to think about uh, uh, common projects uh, to to uh, solve those kind of problems uh, not just for today but also for the future so the global issue can only be solved on a global basis and uh, i think uh, that helps a lot 
to understand each other much better. Because if the mankind is facing an enemy uh, altogether from somewhere else, a biological enemy, then probably it brings us much more together and makes us harm more more harmful and uh, and uh, it it helps us to to uh, listen to each other and to like each other much better and maybe then we discover that the world is ours and that it doesn't make sense mm. to make trouble against each other in this world because we have a lot of enemies in this world that are not human beings and they attack us. So human beings should come together and it's the first task of governments to manage this process. I hope governments will learn out of this situation as much as we do personally. Thank you, thank you. Very profound statement. I think it is It is a, a really a good opportunity for for country to re rethink that uh, we can take this opportunity to learn the, the lesson from coping with coronavirus so that we can uh, unite more to face our common enemy, which shouldn't be from ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ianinsky? Ianinsky? Uh, yeah, well, it's very Ianinsky. difficult to add anything to Professor Tsek. <laughs> very profound and sound yeah, statement. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I should say that... Uh, we, with this understanding of what he said, mm. uh, we need to develop uh, viable tools. Mm. Like our map is the first approach, mm. but we need a lot of things like that, mm. that would uh, enable our collaboration on global scale and very fast co-development of, uh, of the best solutions to the global problem. So mm -hmm. Next time we wouldn't need months and months and even years mm -hmm. to, you know, to tackle the things, but we might be able to join our forces through efficient international mm -hmm. tools. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to add. Thanks. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, I think you have uh, already done a great job in, in Moscow, having so many uh, innovation being gathered together and open to, to the re rest of the world. I think this, it is already a very good start. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Castillo? Okay, I just want uh, to add uh, to the two. Uh, I think that uh, technology is playing an integral role uh, in the world today, and, and all the sectors are benefiting from what it has to offer, and the health uh, sector is no exception. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can benefit significantly uh, from predictive analysis, as I said in my presentation, mm -hmm. and to connect people with governments uh, to prevent or to improve uh, the people's uh, the people's uh, health. Mm -hmm. However, uh, with these advantages, there are many emergency risks uh, that need to be navigated for all involved parties. Mm -hmm. Uh, to benefit from the full potential of these technologies. And it's uh, really, really, really important to preserve uh, the people's privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, this point, uh, as you said, uh, should be a priority uh, for the governments in any uh, control of the population or in any interaction uh, with the citizens to think first in their privacy. Thank you, thank you. I think uh, uh, I had uh, more than uh, 10 uh, students from UBC in Catalonia who did their thesis with me in Taiwan. Uh, four of them did something called blockchain. Maybe you want to look into the uh, potential of blockchain to cope with the problem you are facing right now. And we can also discuss on the, the technology in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for all the uh, panelists uh, for great uh, interaction. And, and, and also thank you for your participation of the, the session. It was a great session. I enjoy it very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the perfect moderation, Mr. Cho. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Mr. Joe, for moderating the discussion.
And our deepest appreciation goes to all the delegates for joining us in today's C Talk session. A friendly reminder that at the same time tomorrow, we will be live streaming our last C Talk session on the topic of e governance to discuss how cities stimulate the deployment of smart city technologies and innovate business applications after COVID 19. Once again, thank you all for participating in C Talk Online this year. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care.